Warning, the following podcast is a shit show, and the individuals you are about to meet are idiots. Their opinions, anecdotes, and advice contain zero nutritional value. This is the critical human condition and all of its strangeness. This is life, according to an idiot. Welcome. Welcome. Everybody, to your favorite podcast. Yes. According to an idiot. That's us. Yule greetings. Uh, if you're listening to this, you might be curious about Christmas stuff and Yule stuff. Yeah, baby. Yule Tide, it might also be called. Also, I'm your host, Mo. <laughs> I didn't say that. I'm, I'm your other host, Jeremy. <laughs> I wait for Mo to say Mo and then I say Jeremy. It is a chaotic morning. Yes. We are both tired mm-hmm. and feeling rambunctious. I, that's one way to put it. I have a horrible migraine. <laughs> All right. You ready to start this thing? Yeah. It's Christmas time, everybody. I, Christmas time. I guess it's not just Christmas time because I just because we're a bunch of whiteies mm-hmm. and we celebrate Christmas. Grew up in America. I mean, we've got Hanukkah. We've got Chinese New Year. We've got Boxing Day. We've got Christmas. We've got some of these days aren't religious. We've got <laughs> St. Nicholas Day. We've got Kwanzaa. We got Yule. We got Winter Solstice. We got Feast of the Immaculate Conception. Oh, fuck yeah. Christmas time, I think, is more, especially in America. I think it's become almost secular now. Mm-hmm. A state of being. For example, I am not a practitioner of any faith, but like, I know you're not that, well, you're kind of like a witch now, so. <laughs> yeah, well, where are you at spiritually? <sighs> <laughs> I, you know, I... Oh boy, okay. I don't believe in gods, okay. but I do believe that we're all connected in some sort of way. Mm-hmm. What way that manifests, I don't really know, but I do feel energy within the universe that we can tap into. And I feel like there is not necessarily a destiny, but like a grand scheme of your life. Yeah. Like a blueprint. I don't know if that makes any sense when it comes to like talk of religion. <laughs> <laughs> so I believe in the best way I've heard it put mm-hmm. is that I believe in a universe that doesn't care and people that do. Yeah, I feel like that's a good way to put it. If you care, you're changing the world, kind of. The way I kind of see it is everybody's doing their best. Yeah. In one way or another, whether they're acting on it in a productive way, people aren't defined by their moments necessarily. So like, I want to give that grace to other people because I know I have my moments where I'm probably not the most kind. But I like the idea of the egg story by Andy Weir. Mm Mm-hmm where we're all just reincarnations of ourself. So we're constantly just interacting with ourself. Yeah, we're all one person. We're all one person. So I, I want to extend that kindness to someone else. Maybe not in the literal sense that we're all reincarnations of ourself, but my lived experiences and the amount of consciousness that I have in my life, everybody else has too. And sometimes that like one interaction with someone else can kind of define your day. And you have control over that interaction with someone else. You know, Mm -hmm. if you're an asshole, that's going to define their day. If you're really nice, that's going to define their day. So you have the power to like change, change that. Yeah. And I agree with that. And I say all this and and in two weeks, I'll be cut off by somebody and be like, (laughs) like I'll immediately become the worst human I've ever been. I hope you fucking die. Yeah, take that with a grain of salt. Poe, but he's nerfed. But yeah, I think most of these kind of thoughts always come up around Christmas time, around the holidays, because Mm -hmm. it's the time to reflect because a year is coming to an end. And it's a time when we all come together. So like community and love and family also comes into frame full force. And also, of course, Santa Claus. Santa Claus, right. This episode is about the winter season of Yule. Yeah. And Yuletide and Christmas. So let's get into the Christmas mood, Christmas season. Turn on the fireplace. Drop a needle on that Nat King Cole record. Let's get into the Christmas spirit, shall we? As we know, Christmas is a Christian holiday celebrating the birth of who? Santa. No, it's Santa's cousin, Jesus. (laughs) Christmas literally means mass on Christ's day. Mm -hmm. But what if I told you that our modern conception of the holiday season is all relatively recent? (gasps) What? Oh. How recent? As many of you know, the good book doesn't claim that Jesus was born on December 25th. Rather, J.C.'s birthday isn't clearly recorded at all. Mysterious. 
I smell a conspiracy. Excuse me. There are several theorized dates cooked up by theologians. The date most heralded is one preached by Mormons. The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints drew conclusions from revelations shown to LDS founder Joseph Smith. Okay, right. Which revealed Christ had been born in early April. He sat down, crossed his legs, and was like, Jesus spoke to me. I think he put his face in a hat. Okay. That's how he actually did it. And then the hat was like, hey, Jesus was born in early April. Hmm. And he goes, that was a really weird thing for you to say. I was hoping for something more life-changing. I was hoping you would say I would have five wives. Oh, that also. <laughs> and then from that, LDS members narrowed it down to January 6th, a date that would never be relevant for anything ever. Ah, uh, ha ha. A little topical American humor for you there. If he was born in April, how did they get January? I'll tell you why. <laughs> it's religious arithmetic. So due to the date of Jesus' reported death being April 6th, and in some cases it's April 3rd, Scholars followed the belief that prophets die on the anniversary of their conception. Okay. So assuming Jesus was carried to full term, April 6th plus nine months is January 6th. I see. Yes. One account contributes the selection of December 25th to the 4th century Pope Julius I, though this is strongly debated, but we're still going to talk about it. This is speculation and theories, but still. December 25th was roughly two days after the Roman festival of Saturnalia. Roman calendars show roughly 40 annual religious festivals, many of which would last several days, meaning that sacred days outnumbered normal days. Fuck yeah. Many of these festivals incorporated elaborate forms of public entertainment sponsored by the state. This ranged from Roman circuses that featured chariot races and theatrical plays to exotic animal exhibitions and massive parades. These festivals were publicly recognized holidays, therefore it was customary that no business be conducted during them, so everyone had the day off pretty much. Fuck yeah. Interestingly enough, early Christians living under Roman rule were discouraged by their church leaders from partaking in any of these pagan festivities. One major festival celebrating Roman polytheism was Saturnalia, which was devoted to the god Saturn and ran from December 17th through December 23rd. Saturnalia generally entailed religious sacrifices performed at the Temple of Saturn, followed by a public banquet, widespread gift giving, and multiple days of continuous celebration and general merriment. Which kind of sounds like Christmas. Yeah, that does sound a bit like Christmas. A bit a little more hardcore. Yeah, they took out like all the fun stuff. Right. This is like Christmas if instead of milk and cookies, you left out Monster Energy Drink and cookies laced with ecstasy for Santa. <laughs> Red Bull, Jaeger bombs. Even beyond the similarities with Saturnalia, in the year 274, Emperor Aurelian had a temple built in honor of the sun god Sol Invictus the main divinity of the Roman pantheon of gods. Aurelian was a henotheist of Sol Invictus, meaning that he worshipped the sun god as the one true supreme god, while he still acknowledged the other guys, but they just weren't as important. After the Temple of the Sun was completed, the emperor had it dedicated on December 25th. Mm -hmm. It's theorized that Pope Julius may have assigned the holy day of Christmas to December 25th because that date had already become associated with the worship of a singular supreme god. Furthermore, it's possible that Pope Julius set Christmas just after Saturnalia to create a Christian alternative to the pagan festival and set Jesus' birthday to match the Roman sun gods so that Christians and non-Christians could celebrate on the same day, which might encourage pagans to convert seamlessly. Interesting. We can still party and have fun? Okay, sure, I'll join your Christian thing. I'll eat your weird crackers. All right, you weird crackers. I'll eat your weird crackers. <laughs> just as Saturnalia was one of many Roman celebrations... It was just one of many winter celebrations practiced across the old world. As long as mankind has developed belief systems and put superstitions into practice, people have mythologized the natural world, crafting unique understandings of the world through religion and spirituality. So my main point, though, in mentioning that is that early folks, we'll call them pagans, which also was a term made up by the Christians, pagans often found divinity in nature and the natural processes of the world. Mm-hmm. For example, the personification and worshipping of seasons and cycles, which we'll see in Yule. Saturnalia was held in late December, near the winter solstice, when the Romans would reap their last harvest of the year. The god Saturn was associated with agriculture, as well as the passage of time. Saturn partially derives from the Greek titan Kronos, who infamously devoured his children, which was later taken as an allegory for the passing of generations. Both of them were depicted as old men with white beards. 
which also could be why Santa and Father Christmas in general is an old man with white beard. And he's going to be there to eat your children. Fuck yeah. (laughs) There are similar idols and concepts that resemble Saturn and rituals like Saturnalia that existed within Celtic, Slavic, and Germanic polytheism, which have even deeper ties to Christmas. Germanic and Anglo-Saxon paganism and winter celebrations is where we draw the most in terms of Christmas. Mm -hmm. Winter festivals brought joy and light to what was, for many parts of the world, the coldest and darkest days of the year. Early Europeans celebrated the winter solstice, which occurs in late December, when the most brutal days of winter were drawing to a close and people could expect the emergence of longer days and shorter nights. The Germanic peoples came to celebrate the winter festival of Yule during this time. Most popularly associated with the Norse and Scandinavian peoples, the 12-day festival would carry on from the winter solstice, which is like December 20th to 21st, roughly, into early January. The earliest form of Yule can be found in the old pagan calendar used by the Norse. Yule is considered one of the oldest winter solstice festivals in known history, but even then, its precise beginnings are still foggy with historians still arguing the how and why of Yule. It's largely agreed that Yule celebration started as an Old Norse festival called Yule, which translates to mean midwinter season. This precursor to the latter Yule is believed to have emphasized the universal themes common in all winter solstice festivals, stuff like fire and feasts. Yule likewise played on themes of fire and light, utilizing large bonfires and modest candlelight to symbolize the returning sunlight that would literally drive out the darkness of long winter nights. And one custom was that of cutting and burning large lumber or logs, known as Yule logs, accompanied by a feast lasting the duration of its burning. You would like take the trunk of a tree, basically, Mm -hmm. set it on fire, and during that fire, you'd have the main Yule feast. Hell yeah. Yule feasts featured lavish and hearty meals, which were atypical in winter when food was usually, you know, limited or scarce. It's believed that communities would dine on slaughtered cattle. In the harsh climates where Yule was celebrated, most cattle were slaughtered as it became unsustainable to feed livestock. So they're like, well, we got to kill them all. Mm -hmm. Let's make a feast out of it. Whether or not these animals were killed as a sacrificial offering, we don't know. But the ritual allowed for a lot of meat, which was rare otherwise. While technically unrelated, you can think of Yule as a companion festival to the Celtic tradition of of Samhain. And I view it as like it's opposite. It's like the inverse of Samhain. Mm -hmm. So Celtic pagans celebrated Samhain to commemorate the end of harvest season in autumn. And the festival included fires and feasts with sacrifices to honor their gods and the spirits of fallen kin. Samhain served to welcome the approach of winter in early November, marking the start of the darker half of the year. In contrast, Yule celebrates the eventual end of winter and through ritual action sets a hopeful tone for the next year. Yule also comes from the Germanic word Yol literally meaning wheel, and the pagans saw the year as a metaphorical wheel, with December seated at the bottom of the wheel. Mm -hmm. This point in the wheel was seen to represent the shortening of days, but after December 21st, the circle curves back up and the days get longer. So, in terms of customs, ancient Germanic folklore portrays this time of year as a battle between light and darkness, and to a deeper extent, birth versus decay. Because the Yule Festival and Winter Solstice was seen as the light returning to conquer the dark, people would offer ceremonial assistance by bringing their own light into the world, both in a literal sense by burning Yule logs and lighting their homes with candles, and figuratively by celebrating with each other and exchanging gifts as a sign of charity and goodwill. Families would also cut down evergreen trees and use them to decorate their homes. Evergreens were clear symbols of life, persevering darkness, and death, as unlike other trees in plant life, the pine trees obviously, you know, never shed their foliage nor lost their green hue. During these winters, Mm -hmm. and by literally bringing an evergreen into their homes, pagans were signifying the return of greenery that was sure to emerge at the end of winter. Wow. Wow. Symbolism. And we still do it. That's why we have trees. We have trees. I got a fake one. Do you ever ever have a real tree for Christmas? Mm Mm-hmm. It's a pain in the ass. Yeah, it sounds horrible. We we never did it. And I'm kind of glad. Because you have to water it and stuff, right? You have to water it, and then it like sheds all over the place, and you have to like dispose of it. So obviously we carry on the version of these customs and the Christmas tradition of, that's known as the Christmas tree lighting. We have it obviously in, our, in your homes, but I think a more close one is like when like a, a city or a town will be like, hey, we're doing our annual tree lighting where everybody gathers around mm-hmm. and the light shines up and everyone gets all happy because it's like, okay, yeah, winter is depressing, but we have these pretty lights that will make it less depressing, blah, blah, blah. To me, that feels more ancient. Right. And even today, like when you put up a Christmas tree in your house... 
even if you're not religious, which I'm not, it's like a ceremony. Mm-hmm. Put on the ornaments, like every ornament's kind of like a memory and you're talking about it and whatever. And you're putting right. the, the star up and it stuff like, like that. It like smells good in the house. You're yeah. like lighting candles and hanging out with family or friends. Right. This one's a little bit grosser though. Mistletoe. Both the ancient Greeks and Celts viewed mistletoe as representing fertility, and the Greeks sometimes referred to it as oak sperm. Ew. <laughs> this is what gets grosser. The symbolic ties to fertility in romance are likely due to some suggestive visual characteristics of the plant. First off, mistletoe is evergreen, just like the pine trees, and acts mm-hmm. as a parasite to trees. Therefore, mistletoe was easy to find and gather because its host tree lost its leaves in late fall. Huh. Also, if it killed a tree, the only thing that would be left was the mistletoe. So it was easy to find and they would pick it. Cool. So European mistletoe commonly grows on apple trees, poplars, willows, lindens, and more. And when they bloom in late winter, their yellowish leaves produce single seeded white berries that, when ripe, fill with a sticky, transparent pulp. Which early observers understandably likened to... Sperm. To semen. (laughs) To get even grosser, dwarf mistletoe acts as a parasite to coniferous trees. In order to spread and populate, the plant uses hydrostatic pressure to shoot its sticky seeds onto surrounding host trees. Ew. So like, when a dwarf mistletoe shoots its load, it goes as fast as 50 miles an hour. Isn't that fucking crazy? So, like, someone walking by, like, could accidentally get a cum shot. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's really disturbing to me. Celtic druids used mistletoe in sacrificial r- rituals as well as in medicines, primarily fertility elixirs, because they saw that resemblance to human fertility, human reproduction. And then, uh, I don't know how it happened, but then much later in England... The custom of kissing beneath the hanging mistletoe became popular because it was still seen as like it had like a magical quality to it that promised love and marriage would happen if you kissed underneath it. Mm -hmm. So Santa and Odin. They fight. I wish. (laughs) There's there's it's kind of a stretch, but there's some theories that our idea of Santa or like the early Santa Claus borrowed heavily from Odin. Mm -hmm. And there, I think there are, there is some relevant points they make. So I was hoping for like a King Kong versus Godzilla (laughs) type of moment. Odin would definitely win. Yeah. Because Odin's like a god and Santa Claus is like a man that has diabetes. Santa Claus is the legendary Dutch Christmas figure based on St. Nicholas and a key source of the modern Christmas icon that we know as Santa Claus. So Santa Claus is based on St. Nicholas, the early Christian bishop who became the patron saint of children and is remembered for his habit of gift giving. Little is known about the historical factual life of St. Nicholas, which may explain why the holiday legend he inspired is so outrageous and magical. Hmm. Sinterklaas predates Santa Claus and varies as a result. Sinterklaas is an old, serious man with white hair and a full white beard. He wears a white and red bishop's cape and garb with a shepherd's staff, rides a magical white horse, has a book that is a ledger containing a record of all good and bad deeds done by kids. So these are the similarities he shares to Odin. Both characters, both figures, were known to fly around on a white horse, (laughs) wore a lavish coat and hat, carried a staff... They were seen as old and wise, long white beard. They would send letters and gifts, both derived obviously from Germanic cultures. They judged mortals. Odin was called Yule Fodder or Yule Father. Okay. And then also in pre-Christian Norse tales, Odin was said to enter homes through chimneys and fire pits. Wow. Exclusively on the night of the solstice. Odin could be Santa. I think Odin is Santa. Yes. Cool. Well, it's interesting hearing... The start, the beginnings of Yule and Christmas and all these things. And what translates to all of the traditions that we have. So you you touched on a few of them. Why we bring a tree inside and the mistletoes. I have some weirder traditions from around the world that I am going to discuss Mm -hmm. with you. I'm going to go from... A bit odd to scarring. Fantastic. I love it. (laughs) That's my range here. Okay. I'm going to start in Norway. Norway has a tradition of hiding brooms before Christmas Day. According to folklore, witches and evil spirits come out on Christmas Eve to cause chaos. And we all know that witches and evil spirits ride on brooms. Mm Mm-hmm. So families, in order to stop them from being stolen and ridden 
into the night as an escape route, started hiding their brooms. So they could wake up and kill them. Right. They could just stab them. And they're just like still looking around <laughs> frantically for a broom. Please, somewhere. Because um, they, they didn't bring their own. Yeah, really. How'd they get there? They'll also burn spruce logs in the fireplace to stop them from coming down the chimney. Oh, something with spruce. The spruce. Uh... Oh, the fire probably wards them off. Mm -hmm. Okay. I was thinking the spruce did. Yeah. In the Ukraine, there is a little bit of a wholesome tradition involving spider webs. There is this old story, this old folk tale, that there was a poor family that couldn't decorate their tree for Christmas because back in the, the ye old days, mm -hmm. tinsel was made of beaten silver. Oh. So it was actually pretty expensive yeah. to use to decorate your tree. So one night they go to sleep a little sad because they couldn't afford to decorate their tree. And a spider comes out and builds a bunch of cobwebs on their Christmas tree. And overnight, that magically turns into silver and gold strands. The story is very popular. So now people will decorate their tree with spider webs, cop webs, instead of tinsel. Oh, it's like Charlotte's Web. A little bit, yeah. It still says some pig. Yeah, <laughs> some pig. They have a fat dad that gets offended. <laughs> So if you find a spider or a spider's web on your tree, it's a sign of good luck. Oh. And you make it some free money. Money. Finding spiders um, in like Chinese folklore mm -hmm. was good luck and meant you could get some money. Yeah. It's the same for a wedding. It's a good omen for weddings if you find a spider on your wedding dress. Really? Yeah. I don't, I don't remember why, but yeah, that's like a old wives tale. Weird. You might have heard of this one. In Germany, they celebrate pickles. I have. I, have I, I, I've always heard of the Christmas pickles. I never understood why. Yeah, the Christmas pickles. So families will hide a pickle ornament in their tree. The child who finds it first gets a special present. The exact origins of this tradition are not really known, but some people believe it's to honor an American war soldier who was saved from starvation by eating a pickle on Christmas Eve. What? I <laughs> find that hard to believe. <laughs> so it's a newer tradition then. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's somewhat new. And it only caught on in Germany, which is weird. Well, Germany had World War II. So. They certainly did. They there was there was a war there too. And American soldiers were there. Yeah, eating pickles. And we're probably hungry. Yeah. If I was starving and someone brought me a brined <laughs> something that was brined, I think I'd probably throw up and die. <laughs> They're like, I know you're really hungry, but all I have is this pickle. All I have is pickles. <laughs> and the soldier like goes around and tells everyone, they're like, you know what? Wouldn't believe it. We should hide pickles. Yeah. For Christmas. Everybody remember my name. <laughs> John Pickle McGee. <laughs> this one's really interesting too. You might have heard of this one, but in Japan, they celebrate Christmas with fried chicken. Yes, I heard about this. I love this. Japanese people, people in Japan, do not generally celebrate Christmas, but... In the 1970s, there was a manager of KFC who overheard some foreigners talking about how they missed turkey on Thanksgiving. So he decided that he could capitalize on this and maybe give them a way to celebrate while they were in Japan. So he started a special called the KFC Party Barrel. Nice. To celebrate the holiday. The dinner packages are usually filled with chicken, cake, and wine. Oh, wow. Various sides, like traditional American dishes. And it's so popular that they often are ordered weeks in advance because there's such a long line. Wow. And it makes up a third of their yearly revenue. Holy shit. Mm -hmm. A third. A third. Also, only like an American inspired food would be served in barrel form. Right. <laughs> the party barrel. I love that. <laughs> The party barrel. KFC is still pretty good. It is good. You know what? It is good. I got it once recently. I'm like, oh my God, I forgot about this. It's like grandpa food. I get it, Japan. Mm -hmm. All right, Spain. Spain has two and both are very strange and both involve defecation. Oh. So oh. <laughs> the first one, there's something called a uh, kaganer. I hope I'm saying that right, which means the shitter. <laughs> in this region of Catalan, Spain, nativity scenes typically include a man who has his pants rolled down and is taking a shit. 
No. Yeah, and it's very popular. It's very popular. I have to look this up. The origins are lost, but it appeared in the 18th century. Oh, so it's been a while. People think it might be linked to fertilization. Okay. Of crops and stuff. There, oh my God, I'm seeing him. Yeah, it's usually like placed in the corner <laughs> of the scenes, like kind of like a little hidden, like where's Waldo type situation. <laughs> this is incredible. But they're so popular now that you can find versions of celebrities doing yeah. it. Like there's like Shakespeare ones. I see Barack Obama right here. Yeah, Barack Obama. <laughs> <laughs> At the bottom it says, yes, we can. Oh my God. This is incredible. Everybody look up mm -hmm. Google. If you listen to this, Google Catalan. Christmas shitter. Mm -hmm. Wow. I can't believe I've never heard of this. It's beautiful. I want to buy one. Yeah. They have like some traditional looking ones, right? Like it would belong in a nativity scene. Yeah. But other ones are just like, <laughs> it kind of looks like a bobblehead. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> but it's just taking a shit. Spain also has something called pooping logs mm -hmm. for Christmas. So kids are given a hollow log to take care of. It's nowadays made up of like paper and stuff. It kind of looks like a pinata, but it's shaped like a log and it has a face on one end. So it's terrifying looking. I think I'm seeing it right now. Yeah. It's horrifying. So every night the family feeds the log and covers it with a blanket. When I first read this, I thought they were shitting in this log. Mm -hmm. They're not shitting in it. <laughs> yeah. They're putting like treats and stuff inside this log so on christmas they sing log songs and beat the logs with sticks ordering it to eliminate oh my god so it's it's basically a pinata they feed the pinata yeah i've seen oh my god throughout the month and then they beat the shit out of it on christmas <laughs> until all of the candy is gone yeah it's like a, this little blurb here on wikipedia i've seen it says in the days preceding christmas Children must take good care of the log, mm -hmm. keeping it warm and feeding it so it will defecate presents on Christmas Day or Eve. This is incredible. Yeah, it's kind of like in school when you're given like a doll to take care of. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. If you can't handle this doll, you can't handle getting pregnant. <laughs> yeah. But these kids in Spain are like, I'm given a, a log <laughs> every year to take care of. Yeah. And then I beat the shit out of it. <laughs> Just like a real kid. That's how every school project, mm -hmm. uh, the baby school project should end. The last day you get to beat the shit out of that doll. It'd be a lot more popular. And presents come out. Like you cover it with a blanket and everything. It's so cute. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> In Sweden, there is something called the Yule Goat, which is very popular. It's believed that instead of a sleigh, Santa rode the Yule Goat to deliver presents. A little bit slower. Yeah. <laughs> they had the ability to scare away demons, the devil and evil spirits. By the 19th century, the popularity of the Yule goat kept growing and growing and growing. So by the 19th century, the goat had become the giver of gifts himself. Oh, wow. And people would dress up as a goat to give them out. So instead of Santa, it's a goat. That's awesome. The Yule goat. And now every year... More recently, for the last almost 100 years, there is a gigantic straw goat that is built and set up a month before Christmas that is eventually burned down. Okay. And everyone gathers around the Yule goat as they burn it. Interesting. Very fun. Goats to me have always been like demonic. I agree. So it's very interesting that this goat is delivering presents to everyone. But in practice, goats are pretty sweet animals. Sometimes. Ever seen someone give a goat to a horse? No. <laughs> <laughs> so horses are very intelligent and they get lonely because mm -hmm. they live out in the, in the stable. So certain people, if you can manage it, they will give their horse a pet goat and they'll just hang out with each other. Aw, that's adorable. Yeah. If you take the goat away, the horse will get sad. Isn't that adorable? Hey, Eric, I've presented you a friend and now I'm ripping him away. <laughs> yeah, right. What do you mean you're sad? <laughs> In Iceland, there's something called the Yule Creatures. Ooh. So instead of Santa Claus, kids meet the 13 Yule Lads. Oh, we know, we know these guys. Yeah. I think we might have talked about them before. We have another Christmas episode that's solid. Krampus. It's called... The Christmas creeps or whatever, if you can find it, it's a good mm -hmm. companion to this episode. Yeah. So I'll, I'll just kind of brief them again a little bit. But the Yule Lads, the Yule Lads take turns visiting children on the 13 nights leading up to Christmas. The kids place a shoe on their bedroom windowsill on each night. So if they've been good, 
they'll get treats put in their shoe. And if they were bad, then they get a rotting potato. The original version of the tale is that the Yule lads were trolls who lived in a cave in the mountains, and they appeared around Christmas to cause mischief. Each troll had a specific task assigned to it, you know, things like stealing food Mm -hmm. to cause mischief in the town. They also appeared to steal children, which they would boil alive and turn into stew. Oh. The troll family also had a demonic Yule cat, which ate anyone without a new set of clothes. Fashion police. (laughs) So in Iceland, it is now a tradition to always get new clothes on Christmas. The Yule lads have quite fun names, so I thought I would present all of them. I remember remember two of them. Which ones do you remember? Cow sucker. And there's pot liquor, I think. Close. So we have sheep caught clod. Oh, yeah. Sheep caught clod. Sheep caught clod. Yeah. We have gully gawk, stubby, (laughs) spoon liquor, pot scraper. There we go. Bowl liquor, door slammer. Skier gobbler, sausage swiper, <laughs> window peeper, doorway sniffer, meat hook, <laughs> and candle stealer. I feel like beat poetry the way you're reading those off. <laughs> I like meat hook the meat most hook. because I feel like that's very ambiguous. The rest of them are very like, okay, I understand <laughs> pot scraper probably like scrapes up my pots and I wouldn't like that. Bowl liquor is going to lick my bowls, yep. but like, what is meat hook doing? He sounds threatening. Yeah. Yeah. I like Stubby. Stubby's nice. I don't really understand what he's doing, but. Just being fat. I believe it's for a good cause. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, right. Or sheep caught clawed. Yeah. Or gully gawk. I'm not entirely sure what they're up to either, but. Just some great names right there. There needs to be like a series about them. Mm-hmm. The last tradition that I have is the very infamous Krampus, Mm -hmm. which we have another episode on, but I I will talk about it briefly. Krampus is the other side of the coin to Santa Claus, right? So Santa Claus is giving and nice and jolly and, you know, a holy and all this stuff. Krampus is the opposite of all of that. So he's often depicted as a horned monster carrying chains. Oh, God. He often. Yeah, he often uses these chains to scare children. <laughs> ah, ah. Santa Claus, you know, gives gifts to good kids. Krampus will show up for bad kids and will stuff them into his sack and drag them to hell <laughs> or, or just kill them altogether. Fascinating. <laughs> he is accompanied by unruly elves that will also destroy your house. <laughs> So he like shows up with these chains, fucking lasso your kids, shove them in a sack, kill them. And then the elves are like, we're not fucking done yet. (laughs) Burn this place down, fellas. (laughs) Just go crazy. This kid sucks. Do better next time. Next time you have a kid because we're taking him to hell. You're not seeing him again. (laughs) All that tells me is that parents used to be so horrible. Used to? Well, especially then to be like telling your kids this. Right. It's one thing to be like, oh, you know, Santa's going to give you coal or like Bell Schnickel's going to beat you or whatever. Mm-hmm. To have it be like, you're going to be whipped with chains and dragged to hell because <laughs> you didn't clean your room enough or you talk back to us. Right. So that's traumatizing. I can't remember if it was the Yule lads or if it was Krampus, but one of them were banned from being like taught to kids because it was so like traumatizing and scary probably Krampus, for them. Probably Krampus. Yeah. Because the Yule lads feels very kid centric. Yeah, I agree. Krampus is the only thing. It's just fear. It's just about fear. Right. Murder. Yeah. And devilry. Right. But they have like full festivals about Krampus. It's like one of the most popular things. Yeah. Now it might have like overtaken Santa in terms of like popularity and like what they celebrate, which is really interesting. Yeah. In Europe, there's uh, it's still huge to have Krampus festivals and parades. Mm hmm. Just I think because it's such a unique part of the culture, whereas Santa has been adopted everywhere. Right. So you'd probably want to celebrate that more. And it's such like a an extreme opposite. Yeah, it's fun. It's just different. It feels a little like rebellious. Yeah. Absolutely. That's all I got. Well, wow. That was fantastic. In closing, <laughs> what a joyous Christmas this shall be. Unless you've been bad. In which case you will be dragged to hell. Or cooked into a stew. Yes. I think I prefer the stew. Yeah. I mean, it has less long-standing implications. Yeah, I just want to die. I don't want to go to hell. <laughs> but what if when I die, I go to hell? <gasps> I didn't think about this. 
I mean, if you're being boiled in a stew for being naughty, I feel like your chances of heaven are pretty slim. But isn't there something to, to be said about like, you pay the price by the pain of your death? <laughs> I don't know if that's a thing. So I'm being tortured. Therefore, doesn't that give you some angel points? Like your your redemption yeah, a like little you, bit? You, you, You've you atoned for your yeah, exactly, sins? exactly. I don't know if that's a thing, but I always saw that in my head is like, if you have a horrible death, you immediately go to heaven. Like if someone murders you or if someone tortures you. So what happens if you have like a, like a good easy death? Go to hell. <laughs> hell points? Hell points. Or if you're good, no points. Mm-hmm. You just get to die in a bed with your family around you. Well, anyways, that was Yule stuff. That was Yule. Christmas. Watching another year close. Yes. And hopefully more to come, ideally. Every year there's more growth. I know the world is currently on fire. (laughs) It's in critical condition, but hopefully. (laughs) In a few years, we'll have aliens too, so. Uh, Hopefully. We'll see what happens. All right, y'all. So if you enjoyed this episode, this episode is actually suggested by one of our listeners and I think a patron too. Mm -hmm. So if you have episodes that you would like us to talk about, we're willing to do that. This episode is a testament to that. So feel free to shoot us an email at according to an idiot at gmail.com. If you have feedback or you just want to say hi, you're welcome to do that as well. Uh, become a patron. We have early episode release. We have an exclusive creepypasta series. Lots of other fun stuff. You can vote on topics, suggest your own. So if you're not supporting over there and you have the means to and the wants to, definitely check that out. You can stay up to date on our episodes and what we're doing by following us on social media. You can find us at According to an Idiot on Instagram and Facebook and at Idiots Accord on Twitter. You can also help other people find our show by reviewing us on iTunes and now Spotify. Keep your stockings dry and your fireplace lit. Make sure you feed your Yule log and beat the shit out of it. (laughs) (laughs) Till it shits rewards. (laughs) All right, everybody else, happy holidays. And I will see you in time. Bye. We love you.